So welcome to lecture seven already, half of the module already done. And today we're gonna have the life cycle of a star that is closely related to the origin of elements. So now hopefully you see my screen, my slideshow from up front slide. So make the laser pointer and now I'm ready. Okay, what you see here is again Hubble Space Telescope picture from parts of the Orion Nebula. And as you have as we have seen last week, this is a star nursery. So you see here basically star systems in labor in different uh, stages. Here it's already relatively far advanced. That means the star has started to shine produce energy, produce light, and the light pushes now away the gas that is not bound in, in planets or the star itself or smaller bodies. So star nursery. And then today we're gonna see that stars are necessary for us to exist. So, and you know this here already, the chemical elements, probably, from, well, I hope you know it from school, Mendeleev's table. And now this is an older version. There is now a newer version, which I'm going to show when we have done uh, very extreme objects or the death of stars. So this is an older version of the chemical element or table of elements periodic table, whatever you want to call it. And here is now the color coding, the origin. So Big Bang nucleosynthesis would be mostly hydrogen and to a low degree, helium. Then we have here what is called cosmic rays, so lithium, beryllium, boron. That is not exactly true. It's some of them are also lithium, for example, is very likely also primordial directly after the uh, Big Bang. Partially and partially it's then created in the upper layer of the atmosphere, cosmic rays. And then we start with small stars and large stars. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the stuff that we need, fluoron that we need for batteries, beyond that, no. Whatever we need neon for, except of uh, advertisement. Sodium, magnesium, aluminum. And you see, this is uh, here, it starts now as supernova. Wow. <laughs> Type one go up to uh, iron and nickel, so all the way up to this area. And we see again large stars and supernova, so then at some point man-made. So obviously a supernova is the death of a star. We have seen this type one supernovas, but we have these binaries, but one is sucking over material until it reaches this Chandrasekhar mass, and then thermonuclear explosion, nothing is left. Or, we have now uh, a massive star, which seemingly starts to create elements. But then at some point it will die because it runs out of fuel. At least there where it matters, it runs out of fuel. So this is how we saw it until 2014, 15, how most of the elements are made. And then 2016, 17, this observation of these neutron star mergers changed in a bit the pictures. Okay, so this is closely related to something that also has strong influence of our daily life. The elemental abundancy as it is observed in the solar system. Now this here is now basically silicon is 10 to the 6. Silicon is quite abundant on Earth. Silicon dioxide or better known as sand. So 
So silicon would be here, normalized to 10 to the 6, and then we have here again this logarithmic scale, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8. So million, 10 million, 100 million, uh, billion, 10 billion. And then you see that by far the most abundant stuff is hydrogen. Hydrogen, which is basically one proton. Then we have this D deuterium, one proton, one neutron. Then we have helium, here mostly helium-4, but it's two protons, two neutrons. And the protons give us basically the chemical element. In order for an atom to be neutral, we need to attach the same number of negatively charged electrons to these positively charged protons. And we get a neutral atom. And now with three, we would protons in the nucleus, we are at lithium. Yeah. Two or again, two configurations with three protons and three neutrons, that's lithium six. So three protons and four neutrons, lithium seven. It's the same chemical element, it behaves chemically almost uh, basically identical. But for me, as nuclear physicist, uh, reveals complete differences. By the way, I would need to warn you now today, this is, of course, a bit my turf. So some explanation might be, become a bit more lengthy because I want now to show off. Sorry, I try to keep myself, tame myself, but who knows? So be warned. And then we see something between helium, which is very, very abundant, and lithium. <laughs> So if we have one million silicon atoms, we have basically only a few lithium atoms in the, in the solar system. On Earth, of course, the, the, the heavy elements are a bit more than in the rest of the solar system. In general, I, I ask myself how this year was made, because it's hard to go somewhere and, and pick up samples. So. Yeah, this is also one of these uh, plots which somebody made and everybody else uh, thinks, where does this come from? So what we see, we have only very few lithium beryllium boron. This has, for example, drastic consequences. If you want now to, to go for electric cars, you need lithium for the batteries, lithium fluoride. Why lithium is basically one of the elements that really likes to give away an electron and uh, fluoron likes to take an electron. So with them, you can nicely make massive batteries. Now you have a big, big energy difference between giving away and taking on. So you can store most energy. But you need lithium. But now lithium is very rare. It means expensive. And honestly, looking at uh, electric cars, I wouldn't know if I would buy me one because of all the environmental damage where the lithium is mined, which is mostly in, in Chile and the Atacama Desert. So basically, the astronomers sit on the mountains above. Uh, underneath the stuff is mined, and therefore loads of water is used. And this in a desert. It's not too nice for the people. Then you see, what you also need is cobalt. Cobalt is mined in, in Africa under horrible conditions. So this is 19th century slavery almost. So, Oh, I'm a bit reluctant to to have to greenwash my conscience by saying I, I drive now an electric car, which probably half of the, the power is still made by fossil fuels. So I rather try to limit the ways that I travel. And I use the car rather more consciously and otherwise try to cycle. But here you see now. So basically things, you're gonna, we're gonna learn later why that so stars do not really burn lithium. Why? 
we can only learn this. And you see that the influence to our daily life. Another thing is here, if you go to this region, and uh, we have even lesser atoms. This is the region of so-called rare earth. And now you see why it's called rare earth. Because there are so, so the abundance is so low. The crap is that we they have special atomic properties. They are super for magnets, for permanent magnets. It means for for rotors, for uh, windmills, perfect. The crap is there's so few stuff around. It's mostly in China and a bit in Mongolia and seemingly in Afghanistan. But Afghanistan is, of course, hard to exploit at the moment. China is also becomes critical. Well, Mongolia. So again, stuff that we need. Here, the stuff is more expensive than gold, by the way. You see that here, platinum gold is relatively abundant, relatively thin. And in general, we see that we have here some kind of structure. So we step, and then suddenly carbon is back. Oxygen is fortunately there. Neons, uh, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur. 36, I would know to look. I think it's argon. Calcium, and then suddenly we have a dip again. Then we reach uh, iron, which seems to peak, iron, nickel, or there seems to be something going on. And then suddenly it's a steep drop, germanium, strontium, well, smaller peaks. And then again a dip, xenon, barium, xenon relatively abundant. This is because it's a noble gas. Is this chemical property or nuclear property? But then you see here already some indication R and S. And what this means, we're going to explore later. But you see now we have here already a pattern, and there might be some underlying physics to explain this. And we have, and just to remind you, so in general, this uh, curve plot is just one of the top 10 questions in physics. So. But now I want to remind you of something. Looking, taking our satellite and looking back into time, to the era of reionization, basically the birth of the first stars of 200 to 400 million years after the Big Bang, James Webb is going to tell us, because it has the capabilities to see it. Because of the redshift, this is all in the infrared. Hubble couldn't see it, the earthbound uh, stuff can't see it, Spitzer didn't have the, the, the resolution. It was an infrared, but it didn't have the, the resolution. So James Webb will tell us. Okay, and then we are back to the microwave background. Where we have been last time. And now looking further back, so microwave background. Where we basically formed the atom, and before there were the nuclei and electrons separate. Nuclei were mostly protons, so just hydrogen and a bit of helium, and this traces of lithium. So, and there, at this, at this time, we basically had formed the same number of neutrons as protons, very likely, or maybe slightly fewer neutrons because it's a bit heavier. But then we have, if you remember back, that free neutron decays. Because it's energy content, according to Einstein, energy or the mass is a bit higher. And therefore, the energy content is a bit higher. What is what's this? Uh, if we compare the proton neutrons, this 1.3 mega electron volts, which covers the energy that we need to create an electron, so half a mega electron volt. We have 0 0.8 MeV left. But then there is another particle created, this mystical antineutrino. 
and about neutrinos, we're going to talk later again. Well, it, at the moment, the upper mass is 1.1 e. So these are all the build, these are basically billionaires, proton and neutron. And now comes the poor letter round with one pound. It's not exactly the league that I play, or that probably most of us play. And these are the oligarchs. Okay. <laughs> Also, the electron is middle class. So we get their energy, out, which is then given us kinetic movement. That means this process will go on. There's a half life of about half of 10 minutes. What means half of the stuff is gone after 10 minutes, after 20 minutes, we have only a quarter left after. Half an hour, we have only one eighth left, and after two hours, everything is gone. No neutrons around, forget about it. At least not free neutrons, only the ones that have been bound in this helium and bit of lithium nuclei. What a terrible fate. <laughs> so, we have basically no just hydrogen, protons around. Okay, and then we remember this proton was basically dust, which clumped together and then formed the basic protostar. And surrounding the protostar was this accretion disk because of the angular momentum. The original cloud had this angular momentum and then perpendicular to it, the stuff cannot fall in because of this angular momentum conservation. And we get this accretion disk. And in this accretion disk, we might again have local density clumps, which then accumulate and form the planets. Well, here's the protostar. And at some point, the protostar starts to produce light by itself. And then when it produces light, light has this pressure. Light has pressure. The people are thinking to use basically a big, big sun sail to, to use this to propel uh, spacecraft, which probably works for a while, but then of course we are so far away from our sun, that there is no, no light anymore. So there are all kind of crazy ideas. So at some point the star starts to burn and then this light pressure is enough to push away all these gas molecules so out into the sky. Or in the way that they might start to clump up again, you have the hydrogen, maybe some oxygen coming along and then you form a water or if hydrogen and carbon, then you start forming methane or Carbon hydrogen. So, oh, <laughs> this is what you then find in uh, the Kuiper Belt in Oz Cloud. So, on, obviously, here between there is something going on. Somebody is pressing the switch. But we have now basically this accumulation of gas, which of course, wants to expand, so we have a certain gas pressure. But, but still, we have this massive gravity pulling this gas together. And why don't we have to collapse directly towards the mass being so compressed? <laughs> we would have an object that is compact and very likely we would get a black hole. Why is this not happening? Well, it's again this light that is produced somehow in the core. And this light has again this pressure that is, well, we have of course the gas pressure and we get this what is called radiative pressure. Then if the star rotates because the original cloud was rotating, so at the end the star must also slightly rotate angular momentum is still there. So what we get is in the, in the equator, 
perpendicular towards this rotational axis. So at the equator, we get uh, still a bit of what is called centrifugal. This is when you on the roundabout, you need to hold yourself to stay on the roundabout, not to go straight on. So there is a bit of, of pressure point, but this can be almost neglected. Otherwise, we would get the collapse via the points. So, so obviously, is gas pressure plus is radiative pressure is necessary. If a star is too big, it's, I think theoretical limit is 130 times the mass of our sun, it would immediately collapse without becoming really a much of a star to, to become an, uh, a black hole. So then, well, in ideal gas, of course, gas pressure, and the volume are linked to the number of particles, this Boltzmann's constant, and the temperature. This here, what I wanted to point out is basically that pressure and the temperature are linked. Very important. And now, how is the pressure profile when we go from the surface towards the inner of the star? When you dive in a pool, what happens the deeper you dive with your ears? You feel the pressure, and if you do not uh, deregulate it, it's blowing against the nose, then oh, it's very unpleasant. I wonder how this up nowhere diver do it. These guys that can dive 100 meters deep. So, uh, Luc Besos, uh, call the, the Big Blue, very beautiful film if you have time watch it it's about these divers the two 100 meter down and the pressure on the ears must be horrible okay so this is something from our experience the deeper we dive the more pressure is there this means also the temperature must increase and now temperature in a molecular gas corresponds also to movement so the particles are trying to move more and more or with higher energies. And this KPT was basically also some thermal energy. It's now just a question. On top, we have this radiation. Where does this radiation come from? Is it just heat radiation? To a small degree, yes, but this can be basically neglected and it wouldn't work out. If we just uh, say we compress the gas, it becomes now hotter because it's hotter. The Planck spectrum shifts towards uh, shorter wavelengths, higher energies, but that doesn't work out. We need a source of, of a constant flow that produces a source of light particles at best high energy light particles. So this is where does this radiation come from? And now, well, there were two guys. One guy, uh, Alexander, whatever, Alexander, Brit, an independent of him. There's the, the nice story that Hans Bethe, a great physicist, we have to say thank you on behalf of him you British people because his mom was Jewish. So in 33, he was in danger. And fortunately, uh, another physicist called Sommerfeld, he had connections to Manchester and got for him a job in Manchester. His mentor at this time, which was Geiger, the guy with the Geiger counter in Tübingen. Remember this uh, uh, Hans Ruder, same university. Geiger didn't do anything, but uh, Sommerfeld has seen that this highly talented young man needs to be brought into safety away from the barbarism of my grandpa. So he came then to Manchester and later went on to the US and he was a very nice person. But now the Legion says that one evening he was out with his fiance 
on uh, evening walk. And uh, obviously his thoughts were with his fiance. Because the fiance said at some point, uh, look, the stars, how nicely they, they, they shine. And seemingly very unromantic, he answered, yes, and I'm the only person on the planet who knows why. Because he had the idea, this must come, this light, that is in the core of a star and then scatters it towards the outside, that it comes from nuclear reactions. Somehow it must be produced. So just the heat, radi or radiation associated with the heat when compressing the gas. But we know if you take a, a, a bicycle pump and, and pump like hell, and feel later on, you will feel that the cylinder is warm. So basically, he had discovered the mechanism how stars produce their light. So now we have a problem. So nuclear reactions means usually nuclear fusion. It means we have two nuclei and we merge them, bring them together and they merge. But the first problem is, what we learn is that the nuclear force is very short. The nuclear force is very attractive. It's much stronger, 100 times stronger than the uh, electromagnetic force. But it's very short range. So charge radius of a proton, this, this depends on who you believe, a uh, poll from the uh, Paul Scherer Institute in, in Filling, Switzerland. And it's 0 0.86 femtometers, so 10 to the minus 15 meters. If you believe people from mines who did electron scattering, then 0 0.95 femtometers. So, and the arrows uncertainties exclude each other. No mean mean square charge radius of the proton. <laughs> okay. So 0 0.9 femtometer. And now the nuclear forces may be a range up to two femtometers, just four times basically the radius, or two times the radius. Means if we put two next to each other, there's nothing left for the third one. Uh, the force is almost zero. Yeah, no, nuclear force is left, very short range. But on the other hand, the, the electromagnetic force is much weaker, but it's infinite. It range is infinite. So if we approach now two nuclei before they are close to well, nucleons before they are close together and feel the nuclear strong attractive force, there is first this repulsive cool of force and might not allow them to come so close that they ever could merge. We physicists like to express this as potential energy curves. Potential energy curves is basically your notion. What do we have there? If it's negative, it's bound. The system is bound. They, uh, they cannot uh, move away from me. And here's basically the energy plotted, uh, potential energy over a distance of these two nuclei. What we have here is basically the electromagnetic force, which has one over R, one over distance behavior. The potential energy, the force would be R squared. It's the derivative of this potential for the way. We are back in mass. So what means in order to come now from uh, derivative back to the potential from the force to the force, we need to integrate along the way. Yet the Coulomb force would be basically have this. And now at some point, the nuclear force kicks in. The, the range is then strong enough. Or, or uh, what happens, we get no deviation. In fact, because it's much stronger, 
it binds us and what happens then at very, very short distance of half a femtometer, roughly. It kicks in that proton, proton or proton and neutron are both filled, of course. Up, up, down, go. Down, up, up. Up, up, down, no, or down, down, up. It's proton, up, up, down, and neutron, down, down, up. So see now we have then, if we bring them together, we have three quarks. And there is the so called Pauli principle. These are spin half polygons. There's intrinsic, this quantum number that we associate with this intrinsic rotation, which is not exactly true. The spin is quantized in half of Planck's constant divided two by two pi. So basically, Planck's constant divided by four pi. And it's a nuisance, isn't it? But these particles, they are loners. They need to follow what is called a Pauli principle. Okay. If they go to a hotel, they will book a room. But each of them, it's single room. And maybe if there is one that has the other direction of rotation, but the spin is the other way, then they might like it together in a bed, but feet, head, feet, head. A bit like train spotting, except that the third boy, if you remember when the red court went to London, then sick boy and uh, back came, and then there were three boys in the bed. Uh, one had to sleep the other way around. It is not possible for, for the spinner half part. They need to follow this Pauli principle. And this means that they can't come too close to each other. They at, at some distance, they repel each other. This causes here this what is called this hard core. So the core is basically they cannot penetrate into each other. It's because of this substructure, because of this Pauli principle. But what I wanted to show you here is potential energy. So in the moment we are here, between here, the, the distance between these two centers of these two nucleons would be this range. We would have a bound system. This they stay together and form basically a new nucleus with double the mass, or bit double the mass, bit is, lo bit is lost and invested in so-called binding energy. If you don't believe in this, ask the people in Hiroshima. They have seen what is released or what is the consequence if this binding energy is released. Okay. So we have basically now the problem. We come from infinity. And then we would need enough energy that our particles basically overcome this year what we call the Coulomb wall. Once here, obviously, the particle gains energy by sliding down here and ends up then somewhere here. It might have too much kinetic energy, but means it will get rid of parts of this energy, but very likely by emitting radiation. Aha, that's where this energy comes from. This, in order to be bound, if the system, if you put a football on here, that it roll down in this valley and would roll up here again, rolls back if there's no friction, well, it would end up just on the top. And then you have 50% chance it rolls back or 50% it rolls over and it's gone. The same is true for the nucleons. So if they need, while they are then in somewhere here, there needs to be light emitted. This is exactly this light that is then used to stabilize the star. So this excess energy from up here to somewhere down here will be a bound state. This is emitted as light. 
what our problem is. How can we run over this curve? Well, this potential energy curve this is a strange concept, of course. So it becomes a bit more intuitive when we look at the height profile at the stage of the Tour de France. But you're a cyclist, and well, since this year is Alpes, it's usually the, the final of the stage. Now you see a also the distance, the height profile. Then here, obviously, if it goes up, we need to invest work. Once we made it up here, well, from here to, to here, I probably could cycle by myself. Then I would get up, uh, got down and push the bike up here. So, but probably I would never make it up here in the first place. So to invest this energy, I'm not capable. Not in my best days, I wouldn't be. But then up here, obviously, we gain energy. So similar, it's, again, it's basically the same. So, so here the nuclear force that works and bends this down, which would otherwise go here as this hyperbola up this electromagnetic force. Okay. So means if we come now along with a beam of charged particles, well, this is a given energy. If we are here, we would get reflected. What is happening? And now the problem is what we talk about here, this color ball. This is even for, for proton and proton, we talk here about two to three mega electron volts. Two to three mega electron, a million of these electron volts. So remember an electron volt on electron distance one meter and one volt between, we let it then be accelerated. So basically very flat, potential difference where it slides down. It gains in some kinetic energy. This was one electron. Now we have here a height of maybe two million. Okay. So this here, how does this happen? Now I tell you that we usually come here these energies that are far, far, far less. If we look in the temperature of our sun, then we usually have their temperatures of maybe million, two million, or I think it's 15 million degrees, 15 million degrees Kelvin. That sounds a lot. But then we remember that one electron volt corresponds to 11,700 Kelvin. It's 50 million divided by 10 to the four. Then we are there at a couple of hundred electron volts. What the crap. So temperature 50 million degrees and we have only a couple of hundred electron volts. But means if this here, if you go take the train to the coastline, take the ferry to go to Aran Island. If this here is good for so the highest point on Aran, which I would anyway recommend you to do independently that you want now to do that you have now a study reason to go independently for yourself. You probably want to go to Aaron and enjoy a nice day. By the way, you can immediately buy the train ticket to Brodick, what means you don't have to pay the ferry anymore. Okay, 
So you go to Aaron, you look at stand on, on the beach, look up to Goldfell. The height that our particles come in here is less than the waves if uh, on a silent day. We're not talking about a stormy day, we want to talk about normal uh, silent uh, or slightly the waves come crashing in on the beach. Now we have a problem. We want the water on the other side of Goldfell. So in what would this be, Glen Rosa, which is also a very nice place. And I would just recommend go there. So water flashes on the beach and we want it in Glen Rosa. And in between is Goldfell. What the crap. Oh, what would you do? If you're a railroad engineer, so basically here you can build a bridge once you're here. And you come now with your train and there's a, a nature has built this range of mountains in between. So it would cost much too much to build around. What would you do? Would you build a track over it? Or would you hammer a couple of, uh, hire a couple of guys that start to chisel out the, the rocks? Of course, and nature does the same. It tunnels. So a, a, a quantum mechanical particle has the chance to tunnel. That's the so-called quantum mechanical tunnel effect. Discovered by George Gumpf, or explained by George Gumpf. You remember the guy who also explained basically cosmic microwave background together with his uh, pal alpha. Oh, so very, very intriguing. So basically, the quantum particle digs itself a tunnel down here. Now we have to learn that the, the, this is inversely proportional to the width of the world. And then we see being somewhere very low, the, the width is extremely wide. But means this tunneling probability is basically almost zero. But it is not zero. Once tunneled through, so most of the particles will hammer here against and be reflected. But occasionally, very occasionally, one of these particles might make it through. And then it's in here. Will emit radiation and then drop down here. Oh. And then it's bound forever. This is basically as if you fall into a well, well, and try to get out. Same happens then for this nucleon. It's trapped in the nucleus and forms another nucleus. But energy is released. By the way, this form of energy that is released, Hiroshima was uh, fission. So we take a heavy nucleus and split it in parts and get energy out. Here we take two light nuclei and bring them together and fuse them and get energy out. This would be rather the bikini at all. When this massive disaster happened that uh, the Yanks wanted to have their thermonuclear device, a hydrogen bomb, and made were very naive. They used lithium to breed the lithium with hydrogen with one proton, two neutrons, which you need. Therefore, then you use the lithium to breed this. Use natural lithium, one third lithium six, which you new use, and two thirds lithium seven. And they didn't know much about nuclear reactions then. Effectively, this lithium seven is immediately transformed to become lithium six, and then you have three times as much fuel. 
the explosion was instead of what is called five megatons or five million tons of TNT, it was 15. Whoa. Since then, the people that used to live on the Bikini Atoll don't live there anymore. They have been resettled. Oh, okay. So very naive back then. So this is the same energy that basically powers our sun. Okay, this is the energy that one of these processes delivers. So we basically have learned that tunnel probability is inversely proportional to the width. So if we have an increasing energy, we come higher in, the width of this wall is decreasing and therefore the probability is drastically increasing. It's an exponential function even. The tunnel probability goes up with the energy. So what happens if we increase the charge of one of these particles? This was no proton or proton. The force is twice as repulsive if you start proton on helium. Because we have no more charges involved. Electromagnetic force is charge one multiplied with charge two. If you have helium and helium, we have even four times the repulsive force means the cooler wall is now, if you have double the charges for one partner, so hydrogen and helium, we double basically the cooler wall, but means the, the, the wall becomes massive. And therefore, therefore the tunnel probability drops. But means the heavier the stuff is that we try to merge, the lower the probability that this process happens. And at some point, this is then so low that we forget about. Even protons cannot tunnel through to maybe iron that is then roughly, or we need very high temperatures. Okay, now the protons itself, this is a plasma, and the plasma follows nicely. Again, the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, like we had for a gas. A gas was a given temperature and a given, uh, we leave it alone. Collisions between the partners, it is collisions by uh, the electromagnetic force. We make the protons to adapt a, a characteristic velocity distribution and with this velocity kinetic energy distribution. Again, this Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So, tail up and then this longer tail towards higher energies but the number of particles basically over the energy and now we see that we lose that is really annoying huh? so and here basically what we have that this temperature centroid somehow of the, the, the distribution is proportional to the temperature and the, therefore why the ideal gas law to the pressure. What means where are we in the nucleus? Uh, where are we in the star? Obviously the pressure in the center is highest and therefore the temperature is highest. Therefore there is, we have Maxwell Boltzmann distribution which uh, this tail is pointing out more to the right. Okay, so now we basically increase a bit the, the temperature or the pressure. Could make, for example, that's what happens now. Oh, sorry, whatever. This here was no crap. Okay, hopefully I find them. So hopefully, sorry about this. So also if we have a heavier star, it means that the surface deepness where you basically are when you're in the center is much, much deeper. The pressure is much, much higher. Temperature is much, much higher. Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, if we increase the temperature, 
You remember this was then shifting here a bit more towards the right side. Where the tunnel probability now starts to become, at least for this high energy part of the tail, sizable. Oh, means. Well, this basically, this is also so where the bulk of the stuff is around. Oh my God, every time I touch this. So, up. Where the bulk of the stuff is around, then nothing is going to happen because this tunnel probability is so super low. It's, it's rather here, this part of the, or this tail, the high energy tail, where we have only a few particles left, which have this tail. There, the tunnel probability starts now maybe to become so that something becomes probable. So, obviously, this is a product of the the number of chances, the number of particles with this given energy, with the probability. And this forms us the so-called gum of peak or gum of window after this George gamma. And this is basically the number of reactions that really happen. And we see here, this is a relatively narrow window in this schematic approach. So, so this is where really the reaction happens, where we have enough whole particles with sufficient energy that they have a, at least a, chan a chance to tunnel. And of course, if you make it higher, temperature higher and higher, the Boltzmann distribution goes over and therefore you turn to the right and this gum of peak is increasing and increasing. So, for example, if you now lower the temperature of the star, make the star smaller, for example, what means in the core, the pressure is less, the temperature is less. The Maxwell Boltzmann distribution will again shift towards the left side. What happens to the reactions? Well, if we go to the left, obviously the tunnel probability is drastically reduced. The gum of peak is much, much smaller. So the area underneath the scum of peak is really what the number of reaction it would go further to the left, it would shrink off. Oh. Now we are basically have already learned from this basic, how is the, the velocity and energy distribution inside one of these gases or plasmas. What is the temperature that it's uh, pressure dependent? And the pressure is, of course, depth dependent, therefore mass dependent of the star. Well, we see, for example, that at some point there might be just something where occasionally such a reaction happens, heats the environment. We quickly get something going. But then what happens, of course, the gas is hotter. It works a bit more with pressure towards the outside. It works a bit more, becomes, presses the surface a bit away. It means now the pressure, of course, drops, the temperature drops, and basically the gum of peak disappears. No reaction. What means we need, we have then stars with a minimum mass which are just starting to cook and not. And then not so, so on the occasionally they produce a bit of energy by the means of nuclear fusion, but often not. And these are the so-called brown dwarfs. So this is eight percent or less of the mass of our sun. This is the limit that this process can. Have. But we have also seen that the more mass, the more is the pressure in the center, the higher is the temperature, the more towards the right is this Boltzmann distribution and the stronger is this gum of peak. So now it's time for a quiz. Time for you quickly. Which star lives long? A small star with only a, a 
small amount of hydrogen fuel or massive one with loads of hydrogen to burn. What would you say? Well, you're right. The big ones. Because this tunnel probability is so exponential and big ones, even if the temperature increase is linear, the tunnel multiplied with this tunnel probability that's exponential. So they go much, much faster. They might have much, much more fuel, but they burn it also faster away. So these are the big ones are the rock stars, uh, live fast and die young. While the small stars, they are very fuel efficient. They burn for a long, 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 long time. In fact, if we go half the, the, the mass of our sun, even if these were first generation stars, they are still burning. There is no corpse around. We have star corpses only for stars that are larger, originally larger than the half of the mass of our sun. The others are still burning. Universe is too young. So this is basically the, the, the big ones. These are like the big American cars, like a Hummer. You might have uh, 100 liters in the tank. Then you come along with one, a new smaller car where you have might be only 30 liters in the tank. But the one requires five liters per 100 kilometer. The other requires 40, the big one. That is basically the situation. Okay, now with this knowledge, the mechanism, how stars produce basically the energy. And then we also see, of course, that the, star, the big ones, when the probability is so high and they, they use the fuel up so quickly, they produce, of course, instantaneously loads of energy compared to the ones that just look a bit round. So it's a bit of coiling, but not really. So, the ones produce, of course, loads of energy, and this, which is somehow transferred through all this material to the surface. But it's the surface appears also to be hotter, bluish, because the plant, if it's hot, the plant distribution is shifted towards the ultraviolet, and the stuff appears blue. While the ones that just cook a bit, small ones, they produce at a given time far less energy. If each of these nuclear reactions produce, of course, the same amount of energy, then this is valid. And at the moment, we are just talking uh, mostly about hydrogen, meeting hydrogen. And protons meet, meet each other. So they will appear with a lower temperature, what means the Planck spectrum, the black body radiation is shifted towards the reddish spots. They will appear red. And of course, faint. While the blue ones that produce loads of energy, they need to get rid of somehow to cool away. They will be very luminous and bright. Is this true? Do I talk nonsense? Well, what we can do, we can now use basically, remember Gaia, the satellite that maps the distance towards stars, the, the brightness basically as well. And there was this color, there was the color. So we have brightness and color. If there's really a, a relation, then we would get somehow a band that we would expect. So what we do now, we take all this Gaia data, and then we shift the red ones to the right and the blue ones to the left. And then the bright ones to the top and the faint ones to the bottom. What we will get, 
So I would know anyway, I, I don't know if I have a bit of a break. And probably enough for today. What I will do now is just basically stop this video and give you time to click on this link. This is then one and a half minutes where they take from Gaia, from the data release to this was from 2017 or so. Or 2018, so it's not the newest one, that might be a better one. But essentially, this is the best data sample we have. And then they will do it. And what they get is the so called Hertzsprung Russell diagram. It is Hertzsprung Russell after a Danish lad and a British lad. I would consider it as the heart of astrophysics. There is the, 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 so much information in one diagram, which we will then talk about later. But you have now seen from this first principle about nuclear fusion, this cooler wall and this tunneling, then that a, a gas or plasma is always Bolz, Maxwell Boltzmann distributed. So a few with hard, a few speeding guys that are fast now, the interesting ones. The majority and the few that are snail, it's a bit like on, on if you drive around. You have basically a few that are so small, so, so slow, you go mental. Then you have a few, most people are quite reasonable, and you have a few guys that are, that should be, uh, uh, I would say they don't have the character to be allowed to, to drive a vehicle. Maybe. The only one for the kids is, is tri bikes. Okay, so if you watch this video, you're gonna see the Hatchpong Russell diagram. And next video at the beginning, we talk about it. See you then. <laughs>